Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, Wendy and I are so excited that you are here to get some extra knowledge, and we're hoping to shed some light on some topics that uh, we typically don't talk about very much. We, we tend to ignore these things, so uh, we're thankful that you guys are here to join us. So I am Catherine Mingerhoots, and I'm a physio I'm in Barrie, Ontario for 10 years now um, and after the birth of my daughter when I came back from that leave I opened a private practice um, and part of that is doing pelvic health therapy so that is kind of where I'm coming from talking to the ladies this evening. And so Catherine they're just saying that um, can't hear as well so we'll just try to speak up a little more happens as we're trying to you know get used to the the mic and everything is that a bit better if i hold it what do you think nicole thumbs up okay great Thank you okay and you guys can see the slides okay yes okay we'll get this all right so moving okay so first of all, we kind of just wanted to know what you ladies might like to learn this evening in hopes that we can kind of cover all of the topics that you're interested in. So you can see that chat box. You can put in some of your, your questions or topics in that chat box and then you can let us know to make sure that we cover all of those for you tonight. Um, but I am just going to kind of do a brief overview of uh, what pelvic floor, what pelvic floor means and what pelvic floor function and dysfunction look like and then some kind of tips and tricks and things that you can work on to help with that. So this image here, now when you guys see that screen, can you see this whole bar below or not? I'm going to make that disappear right here. It's not there. It's not there. No. Okay. All right. Perfect. So you can see my cursor. So basically this is just um, an image from the side to kind of get us oriented here. And so keeping in mind that we're talking tonight about the female pelvic floor because we understand that it is all ladies with us this evening. Um, but the same issues do affect men as well. They have a pelvic floor just like ours. Obviously a couple of differences, but there's functions just the same. So these issues can affect men in the same way. So this image is just trying to get us oriented. So it's looking at a female body from the side. So rectum comes up the back here. The uterus sits at the top, coming down through the vaginal canal. The vagina opens up down there. Um, the bladder is below and in front of that. And that opens down into the urethra there. And then all the floor muscles are like a basket of muscles that sit um, below here from the pubic bone back to the tailbone of the coccyx there. And so this image here, we're not going to get too technical, but I just kind of wanted to give you ladies an idea because many of us may not have seen anything like this before. So these two diagrams are looking at the pelvic floor muscles from below. So this would be as if someone was laying down and we're looking above, up at them between their legs. So think kind of pap test or gynecological exam, that would be what this view is here. So basically this is just showing, I just wanted to highlight that there are several different layers of muscles and also just the different directions of fibers. We kind of don't really think about all that's going on down there and this kind of, these images really highlight that the fibers go in lots of different directions. So they go up and down, across, around in a circle. So um, lots of different directions of the muscle fibers and different layers to the muscles as well. So pelvic floor function. So our pelvic floor actually serves several different functions um, and a couple of them you may not be aware of. So the first and most important one is that it is a support system. So essentially it is a basket of muscles that supports our organs against gravity. And you guys can see my video feed here. So here's my little image of, or model of, of your pelvic floor. The muscles are all there. And so it sits like this. So that kind of 3D image helps you to kind of get a sense and um, understand that it's like a basket um, in our pelvis. And then sphincteric. So that means that those, those round circular kind of orientation of muscles, they open and close around um, the opening. So the opening of the urethra, the vagina, and the rectum. 
They also serve sexual function, so really important for orgasm and blood flow. Uh, stability, they assist the pelvic joints and joints and hips um, in terms of stabilizing the spine. And then also a sump, sump pump function, so that's for venous and lymphatic drainage um, and pumps that out of uh, the pelvis. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about pelvic floor function, can anyone kind of give some examples or yeah, some thoughts on what pelvic floor dysfunction might be? Can you give me type in something, anything that you think might be dysfunctional? Okay, All right, mine in the chat box for sure. Anybody have Yeah, so we've got incontinence. We have, oh, Fran's having a hard time hearing. Stuff with incontinence, uh, pain and tightness, being when one sneezes. Yeah. Someone has I got it. Okay. <laughs> and also prolapse. Perfect. So those are all excellent examples. And very confident as well. So incontinence is the first thing that we are going to talk about. Um, and incontinence is essentially just an unintended leakage. Um, and it can be a leakage of urine and it can actually be a leakage of feces or stool as well. So in this context here for this slide, we're talking about urinary incontinence, so um, unintended leaking of urine. Um, but there are several different types of incontinence, and you may not kind of be aware that. Um, it does look different for different people. So stress incontinence is the most common type, um, and that is an involuntary loss of urine due to an increase in intra-abdominal pressure. So think, I pee a little bit when I cough or sneeze or laugh. And it's usually a small amount. Um, urge incontinence is the next, next one down there. And so that is an uncontrollable need to void. Um, and then there's leakage associated that an urgent incontinence actually is usually a much larger amount than stress incontinence. Um, urgency itself is, is also a pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, it's a pelvic floor issue, but it just is that urgency in terms of an uncontrollable need to pee or to void, uh, but not the leakage part. So there's a few kind of separate things there. Um, mixed incontinence is the next one down there. So that is urine loss associated with an increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Um, that's the stress incontinence piece. And then also attached to that, the urge incontinence as well. So the uncontrolled. So mixed means both numbers one and two together. Um, overflow incontinence means that the bladder does not empty normally and it becomes very full or distended. That one, not quite as common, usually associated with some type of neurological disorder, um, such as MS or something along those lines. And then functional incontinence is something that we often see in elderly people. So that is urinary leakage associated with an impairment of cognition or physical function. So for example, someone who's broken their hip and they physically can't get out of bed to get to the bathroom. So that would be an example of, of a functional incontinence there. Or, or something like dementia. So someone with dementia has to have the the cognitive capacity or psychological uh, capacity to, to get to the bathroom. All right, so we're going to talk about a few common myths here. So the first and second ones there. So this is one that I hear all the time. So it is normal to have urinary leakage during pregnancy and after childbirth. And the second one, it's normal to have urinary leakage as you age. So those are really common myths. Um, people think that, but that's not actually the case. So just because something um, is common doesn't mean that it is normal. So the third one down there, uh, everyone should do Kegels to maintain continence. So we, we kind of hear that myth often that everyone should just keep strengthening their pelvic floor and that's the best thing for everyone to do. But in fact, Kegels are not for everyone. As you know, now know that there are several different types of incontinence. Um, and so the treatment is actually different for those different types. So 
just just because someone has pelvic floor dysfunction doesn't mean it's a weak weakness in the pelvic floor. Basically, um, there can be tightness and tension, and that can cause incontinence and and issues in pelvic floor dysfunction as well, just as much as weakness can. So, just because someone has issues with their pelvic floor, it doesn't mean that weakness is, is the only issue. Um, because some of the fat incontinence can be can be caused by hypertonic or tight pelvic floor muscles as well, and doing kegels is not going to help that part. Uh, the next one down, everyone knows how to contract their pelvic floor. So this is actually not true. Research has shown, and I can attest to this fact, that not everyone knows how to contract their pelvic floor. So one research study actually demonstrated that a group of healthy women uh, who were verbally told to, to do a Kegel or to contract their pelvic floor muscles, uh, only 50% of those women were actually able to do that. And only 25% and 25% of those women actually were bearing down instead of contracting their pelvic floor. So that actually can potentially make the issue worse. So not everybody actually knows how to do that. You can all relax your pelvic floor right now. And the next one here, I should pee just in case. So I think we are rushing to work and we don't want to have to go to the bathroom when we get to work. So we're just going to go to the bathroom before we go to work, even if we don't have to actually go. Um, and this can kind of create a bit of a vicious cycle, unfortunately. So quick little tidbits here are just um, about some physiology of our pelvic floor and how, how that works. But our bladder works via a reflex system with our brain. So as the bladder fills up, it sends a message to the brain that says, I think I might need to pee, pee soon. And then it fills a little more. And then another message gets sent to the brain that says, okay, I need to pee right now. And so then the bladder contracts and the pelvic floor muscles have to completely relax to allow the opening of the urethra to allow the urine to pass through. So essentially our bladder and pelvic floor muscles work opposite one another, but it's through that reflex system that makes that happen. Um, so if we continually just, if we pee just in case, we can actually dampen that reflex and that kind of hinders the process and it tricks our brain into thinking that we have to go sooner than we actually do. So it's actually a bit counterproductive to continually pee just in case if you don't actually have to. That being said, I'm not saying that you need to hold your pee as long as you possibly can. So some people interpret it that way as well. So that's definitely not what I'm saying. Don't try to hold it. If you actually have to go, you have to go. But just try to avoid those just in case peas, just because it's convenient. Okay, the next one down. So he goes on the toilet. So some people think I should work on my pelvic floor muscles while sitting on the toilet because stopping the flow of urine might help make my pelvic floor stronger. Um, and as I kind of just talked about there, the pelvic floor muscles and the bladder muscle, they work opposite one another. So the pelvic floor muscles need to be completely relaxed to allow that voiding to happen. Um, and that's what needs to happen on the toilet. Your pelvic floor muscles have to completely relax. So you don't want to confuse that process. You don't want to be contracting the pelvic floor muscles while you're sitting on the toilet because they need to, they need to totally relax to allow that function to happen. Um, and stopping the flow of the urine can actually lead to change to guys if you do that continually. So that's not a good idea either. And then the last one there is that there is nothing you can do about urinary leakage, and that's not the case either. Okay, so how common is incontinence? So these are some Canadian stats. So one in four women are in Canada are affected by incontinence, and one in nine men. Um, but only one in 12 of, of these people are known to healthcare professionals because people think it's embarrassing, there's a stigma around that, um, or it's a private issue, and they may not know that there's something that can be done about it. Um, and then in terms of the distribution here for women on this side here, so elderly women um, account for 30 to 50 percent of uh, women with incontinence, middle-aged women 30 to 40 percent, and young adults 20 to 30 percent. Um, and incontinence is actually a very costly problem as well. So not only to the individual who suffers from it, but also to employers and to the healthcare system in general. So in Canada, an individual with incontinence will spend between $1,400 and $2,100 per year on incontinence products. So that's a pretty significant cost per person. 
Okay, so someone actually mentioned pelvic floor prolapse when we asked about dysfunction. So that's fantastic. Someone has heard of that. Um, so pelvic organ prolapse is an annoying protrusion at or near the vaginal opening, which may or may not be accompanied by perineal pressure that's aggravated by standing and relieved by lying down. So basically the symptoms that are most common with pelvic organ prolapse are like a heaviness or a pressure, or sometimes people can actually feel the tissues bulging um, at the vaginal opening. Uh, prolonged standing, it's more, more common in people who's whose jobs require them to stand all day long or people who suffer from this notice that after they've been operating for a long time, um, their symptoms seem to get worse and that's because it is gravity dependent. So gravity pulls things down a little bit. So quick image here, just highlighting that there are different types of pelvic organ prolapse. So pelvic organs, that's kind of the, the overall term, but obviously there are a few different pelvic organs and each one of them can actually prolapse or, or protrude or come down. Um, so this is the normal anatomy. We already kind of looked at that image earlier on. Um, so this first one over here is a bladder prolapse, which is called a cystocele. And so you can just see that the bladder has come kind of backwards and down and it's pushing into the vaginal canal at the front there. And this one here is going to be a rectocele. So this is where the rectum is pushing forward into the back of the vaginal canal and down. And then this one here is actually the prolapse where the uterus is coming straight down through the vaginal canal there. So there are several different types of pelvic organ prolapse. So some risk factors um, for incontinence and prolapse. Those are kind of the two biggest areas of dysfunction that people like to know about. So that's kind of why I put those ones first. Um, but you'll see that there are obviously several different risk factors. Unfortunately, the fact that we are women is a risk factor in itself. Um, pregnancy is a risk factor and having vaginal deliveries is a risk factor and um, multiple births, so having more than one children, um, obesity, surgery, so obstetric trauma, um, quite a few of these are the same. That's kind of what I wanted to highlight with these side by side is that you'll notice that for the risk factors for both of these um, issues are, they, there's quite a bit of overlap there between the two of those. Okay, so pelvic pain or pelvic pain syndromes is another um, piece of pelvic floor dysfunction that people often like to know about. Um, it, again, is, is a catch-all term. So there's numerous syndromes that are characterized by pain in the pelvic region, and they could be internal or, or external pelvic pain. Um, they have a lot of big names, so I won't go into all of the specifics, um, but there are several different types, and the presentation and the contributing factors to each of those is different. So uh, for example, I'll just give you one here. So vestibulodynia is pain or hypersensitivity um, on light touch to the vestibule, which is the opening of the vagina. So that could happen during intercourse or during insertion of a tampon. Um, and and basically there are, there's basically a pain syndrome that is going to affect each different area of the pelvic region and a different name for all of those things. But how it presents is going to be very different from, from one to the next and also what the contributing factors are going to be quite different. So they're usually related to a combination of physical and non-physical causes. So specifically for pelvic pain syndromes, there often um, is there there are often some some non-physical contributing factors. So anxiety is one of them. Um, and we can kind of think of this example in terms of how how our mental state or um, our perception of, of situations can affect pain. So if I give you the example of, um, let's say that on Friday evening, you were out um, with your friends, having a couple of drinks, having a good time, everyone is laughing and you stub your toe in the kitchen. And what does that feel like to you? How do you perceive that injury or pain? Um, or how much pain do you have related to that injury? And then take that few days forward to Monday morning. You're getting ready for work, you're rushing, uh, you forget your lunch, someone cuts you off on the way to work, and as you're running into work, you stub your toe. And what is your perception of your pain there? So same injury, 
but our um, kind of our, our state of mind really significantly influences our perception of pain, even though the injury is the same. So quite often with, with different pelvic pain syndromes, um, there are a lot of external contributing factors as well as, as the physical factors as well. All right. So when I tell people what I do, uh, this is usually the response I get. You do what? So a pelvic floor physiotherapist um, is a regular physiotherapist, but then they've also done some additional uh, training. So it's a specialized area of physio practice that not everybody does, um, but just specialized education and training and skills. Um, and we do perform internal assessments um, and internal treatment. And so the reason for that, um, people kind of think, well, why would I need an internal assessment? Can't you just kind of figure out what's going on? And, and sometimes the, oftentimes the external picture um, is important as well, and that can be contributing too, but the internal piece, you can't ignore that. So imagine you had a knee into a physiotherapist for an assessment and they didn't actually roll up your pants and, and look at and feel your knee and wonder what you were doing there really, or how are they going to help you? So these are just some of the things that are included in um, a typical assessment. So a fairly lengthy subjective history, because that is a really important piece of the puzzle to try to find out um, what's going on. Um, sometimes that includes a bladder diary, which is literally writing down your, your intake and your output and times of days and how long you're cleaning for and um, what you're taking in terms of food. So that's what a bladder diary is. Um, postural assessment, breathing assessment, looking at your core and abdominal function, elasticity and tone of your muscles, both internally and externally, um, trigger points or tension, internal and external as well, uh, looking at global muscle strength, internal and external, and muscle endurance and coordination, and then prolapse rating assessment there as well. Um, and depending on what what you're having an assessment for. Obviously, there, there could be other uh, factors that are looked at um, depending on what the presentation is. So then potential treatment point. I find it just helpful that people sometimes like to have an idea of what, of what they could expect in terms of an assessment or treatment. And that's really fair because, um, again, it's not an area of practice that people typically associate with physiotherapists. Um, and it is, you know, a fairly anxiety provoking issue for a lot of people. So it's helpful to know kind of just what to expect. So in terms of treatment plan, again, totally based on the assessment uh, findings and the goals of the patient and what the, what the issues are. So I can't just say this is what you would do. Um, it depends on what, what we find, um, but it could look, incorporate um, some of these factors. So postural retraining is really important. Uh, relaxation, body visualization strategies, core strengthening, Functional movements that involve your core, behavior modifications so that comes into play um, quite often with urge incontinence. Uh, public floor muscle training could be a part of that. Manual therapy, internal and external strategies, um, stretch, stretching and strengthening of the internal or external structures, um, returning to exercise and activity progression, and always lots of education. Okay, so I have just a short exercise here um, that I'm hoping you ladies will join me in. If you can, if you're sitting somewhere that you can comfortably come forward to the front of your chair, we're just going to do a short breathing exercise, um, which just kind of highlights how important breathing is in terms of our, our posture and core function and thus pelvic floor function as well. Um, Okay, so if you come and sit forward towards the edge of your chair, so just your bottom is on the edge of your chair, you're going to put one hand on your belly and one hand on the outside of your ribs. And the goal here is to just stay nice and relaxed. So as you inhale, I want you to take a deep inhale through your nose. And you're imagining your belly filling up with air. So your, the hand that's on your belly is expanding forward and your ribs are expanding out to the side as well. And obviously you can keep exhaling as well. So just inhale and exhale in through your nose, out through your mouth, and just try a couple of relaxed breaths. Imagine your belly expand forward and downward 
and your ribs expanding out to the side. So try to just get a sense of that inhale and now bring your attention towards your pelvic floor. So you should kind of feel that sitting along the, um, the top of your chair there. So you can feel kind of your reference points are your, your sits bones or your ITs, those two bony parts in your buttocks, and then also your perineum. So kind of firmer part between the anus and the vagina. So you should be able to kind of see, feel that sitting on your chair there. And that's going to be your reference point. So as you inhale, big breath in, your diaphragm, which is your breathing muscle, sits below your rib cage. It flattens out. It pushes your abdominal contents downward and also lengthens and lowers your pelvic floor at the same time. So really just focusing on the inhale, focus your attention to your pelvic floor and see if you can feel inhaling things are lengthening and lowering and you feel your pelvic floor um, a bit more noticeable on the inhale. As you exhale, that pelvic floor recoils back up and the diaphragm recoils back up as well. So they work in synergy with, um, with each other. They're doing the same thing. So really just focusing on the inhale for a few more breaths. Thinking inhale to expand and then you're going to change your the exhale so that recoil piece that happens it just happens automatically it's not something you're actively doing focus your attention on that exhale for a few breaths as well and think about that pelvic floor lifting and engaging so once you kind of get the breath down then you can incorporate um, some visualization in terms of your pelvic floor function so inhale to expand, so pelvic floor lengthening and lowering, exhale to engage, imagine that pelvic floor drawing up and in, and then actually add in some of the pelvic floor exercises and coordination with your breath as well. So you can actively try to engage your pelvic floor, or do that Kegel, Kegel contraction um, as you exhale. All right, so moving on to research, I won't bore you with research studies, but there is um, a significant amount of research to support uh, pelvic floor physiotherapy. So I did talk about that one study already um, that found that 50% of women were, were doing those cases correctly and the other 50% were not. Um, and also pelvic floor physiotherapy is, is mainstream care in Europe. So the British government mandates that a trial of conservative management or pelvic floor muscle training happens prior to approving surgery for incontinence. Um, so they value it that highly. And also in France, the government funds six weeks of postnatal physiotherapy care for every mother. So um, some pretty, pretty progressive stats over there. But if anyone is interested in specific research or um, papers or anything, let me know and forward those to you. I'm happy to do that. Okay, so just covering some basic tips for pelvic floor muscle training, um, just because we sometimes like some take home messages with, with the education as well. So having your pelvic floor assessed is really the biggest thing. It's really difficult to know how it's functioning or if it's functioning well unless someone is actually assessing that. Um, you need to have awareness first. So we use visualization quite a bit for women who have a really difficult time engaging their pelvic floor. We do use a lot of visualization. So there's lots of different cues and different cues work for different people. Um, so some examples of those in terms of uh, the different areas that we're contracting. So thinking the urethra is gonna be the opening at the front, the vagina will be in the middle and the rectum at the back. So if you imagine a raisin at the tip of your urethra and you're trying to draw that raisin up and in, uh, or a ping pong ball at the opening of your vagina, and you're trying to draw that ping pong ball up and in, or a marble at the tip of your rectum, and you are trying to draw that up and in. So those are just some of the, the cues that seem to help people kind of make that connection between your brain and your floor. It's difficult because the pelvic floor muscles work like any other muscle. They contract and relax. Um, they get tight. They get weak like any other muscle, but it's just difficult to conceptualize that because we can't see those muscles so it's hard to know what to learn um so never performing kegels on the toilet we talked about that already so that's a good tip to keep in mind um, it is a combination of strength endurance and coordination so it's not just about the strength piece and uh performing 300 kegels i've literally heard that before someone says i should do 300 kegels at 12. that's not 
really the best advice. It is about strength and endurance and coordination. So all of those pieces need to, to be functioning properly. And then avoid using compensatory muscles. So a lot of time people who have a difficult um, time engaging in pelvic floor, they use compensatory strategies. So lots of abdominal um, muscle use or external hip muscles, they squeeze their glutes. The goal is to really kind of isolate those pelvic floor muscles when we're talking specific pelvic floor muscle training. So some basic tips for improving incontinence and prolapse of having your pelvic floor assessed again. You can't really stress that enough because it is a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, bladder irritants. So that is something that I do a lot of in terms of education. So um, people who have issues with incontinence don't necessarily understand that what they're taking in. So that's where that bladder diary comes into play. But what they are taking in in terms of fluids can actually be contributing to the problem. So a couple of examples of um, things that irritate your bladder would be alcohol, caffeine, carbonated beverages, artificial sweeteners. So those are just a few of the things that can actually irritate your bladder and make things worse. Um, constipation management is something that we look at quite a bit and there are lots of different strategies for that in terms of increasing fiber and increasing fluid intake um, and toileting hygiene for positions are actually really important so this image here um, is of someone sitting on the toilet with a squatty potty so i don't know if you ladies have heard of the squatty potty but um it's a little stool that goes in front of the toilet and you prop your feet up onto it and it actually um puts everything in a much better position to have a bowel movement so a more normal position so things can uh, pass more easily avoid going just in case we talked about the reasons behind that already and then selecting exercise and activities that limit the downward or intra-abdominal pressure so we talked about that as well so that intra-abdominal pressure think coughing sneezing um, lifting something heavy all of those activities increase your intra-abdominal pressure which pushes the pelvic floor downward um, so selecting exercise that don't necessarily aggravate um, or increase that intra-abdominal pressure. So no more crunches. Can't stress that one enough. Um, I think that people think that they really need to work on external abdominals, but it's actually the core function um, of what's underneath that that is the most important. And so I thought I would just touch on kind of just some basic information about pre and postnatal care in terms of public health physiotherapy. Um, so the things that we would look at would include so sacral iliac joint pain, pubic symphysis pain, and different pelvic pain um, syndromes can be quite common during pregnancy. Um, obviously, incontinence and prolapse, we looked at those risk factors, and we know that pregnancy itself is risk factor for both of those things. So those things tend to pop up um, often during pregnancy. Um, but there are actually some labor preparation techniques that we can do to help get ready for labor. So in terms of tissue prep and stretching, et cetera, some perineal massage and different techniques there. So um, even if you're not having symptoms or having issues prior to having the baby, it um, can be helpful to just get things going in terms of uh, preparation for the delivery. And then postnatal care. So again, incontinence and prolapse, um, those creep up as well. So uh, again, that vaginal delivery is one of the risk factors. That's not to say that if you have a C-section, you're completely immune to those things because it can happen as well, but just more common with the vaginal deliveries. Diastasis rectus abdominis. So you may have heard that before, DRA, and that's the separation of the abdominal muscles that come away from the mini alba down the midline and create that doming or pouching um, along the center of the abdomen. C-section scar management is something that uh, we deal with a bit. Uh, core strengthening, so I just mentioned again that it's not about the external abdominals and how strong they are, but it is about the core function underneath that and, and the tension of, of the core underneath. So when I say core, sometimes actually people might think that um, your core is your external abdominal, but really kind of your main core muscles, your diaphragm at the top, so breathing muscles at kind of the top of the canister, pelvic floor muscles, that basket or bowl sitting at the bottom, and then transverse abdominis wraps around us like a corset, and then multifidus runs up and down our spine. So those are kind of your core four, um, and that's really what we try to target in terms of core function and, and core strengthen, strengthening. Um, and then safe and progressive return to exercise and activity after pregnancy or after delivery, and blocked milk ducts is something that um, not a lot of people think of, but 
Um, it's actually been shown that ultrasound can be effective in unblocking milk ducts. So that is kind of my basic information. I know it is a lot to take in, but not too deep in terms of each of the topics, but I wanted to kind of cover a few different things. Um, but I'd love to hear if anyone has specific questions or um, if there was anything specific that people posted there, Wendy, that they wanted to cover that we might not. Yeah, so before I get into my piece about essential oils and how you can use them in a number of different areas with um, pelvic health and pelvic floor dysfunction, we did have some questions, Catherine, in the chat box. All um, right. One person wanted you to cover, you know, Pre, uh, prenatal and postnatal, some tips on that. So you've covered a little bit there. And if you have more, someone else wanted to know some oils for men with pelvic floor dysfunction. So I will cover okay. that. And then um, one person wanted to know her pelvic floor dysfunction is related to muscle tightness and wondering if they can do anything treatment wise or exercise wise. And I just tried to clarify if she's been assessed before, um, but anything to relax the muscles a bit or relieve the pain. And I'll touch on oils for that, but whatever you want to add in there. Sure. Actually, yeah, I can definitely touch on the, the tension piece because that's great to kind of bring that up. As I said, kind of at the beginning, a lot of people really think that pelvic floor dysfunction is only related to weakness of the pelvic floor. And that's really not the case that it can just as easily the um, tension or tightness of those pelvic floor muscles. I've said they're the same as any other muscle. You just can't see them, and so they get tight too, or they get trigger points. Think of those nasty knots that you, you know, might, might get in your traps when you get a massage therapist to have those worked out. So um, internal trigger points can cause a lot of problems in terms of um, dysfunction and, and pain. And so there are strategies for internal trigger point release. Um, there are manual strategies that a therapist can do. There are self strategies that the patient can work on. There's tools and devices that you can use to help um, with the tension and the trigger points and then um, stretches. And oftentimes the external hip musculature is, is quite tight as well. And so it involves both internal strategies and external strategies. Um, also with the tension and tightness, a lot of breathing, retraining, and relaxation exercises go along with that too um, and a lot of education. So yes, there are definitely strategies that can help for those of us who are, have a lot of tension in our pelvic floors. Um, yeah, so I'll mention that Catherine is in the Barry and surrounding Simcoe area and probably beyond. So you're welcome to book an appointment with her for an assessment. There was another, so if you want to screenshot her contact information there, um, that'd be a great idea. And then Seth asks, what are the ideal timelines for seeing a PT in pregnancy? I love this question because prevention yeah. is so, so much of a big part of, you know, a healthy pregnancy and birth and follow-up. You're right. It is. So I love that you have, have asked about seeing one during pregnancy because not a lot of people know that we can do anything during pregnancy. They typically, if they have even heard of it, they think about it um, after the baby is born. So if you're not having any issues and you kind of want to just work on some prevention or start working on the kind of labor prep uh, strategies, then after 30 weeks is, is a good time. So usually kind of 34 weeks, um, as long as you're not having any issues. Of course, if you're having any issues um, with either incontinence or prolapse or pain, um, then you would want to see some as soon as possible because there certainly are things that they can help with throughout the whole pregnancy. But if you're just um, plugging along and things are going okay and you're just looking at kind of that prevention piece then kind of 34, 34 to 36 weeks closer to the time and spend a few weeks working on those um, prep strategies which would be helpful. It's amazing because I wish I knew that I could have seen a pelvic floor physio when I was having my babies because I wanted all natural birth as much as possible and each birth is different but I know it would have been even better if I had more awareness and, you know, I didn't have any pain or issues that were significant that I thought were significant at the time, but anyone can have the assessment done and just make sure everything's balanced out. So you could potentially have, in my opinion, an easier birth process after going through it myself. So. And the other piece I should add to that is that research has shown also that um, if you do a bit of pelvic floor work, 
prior to delivery, it, it can help with the recovery piece. So in terms of our muscle memory and kind of learning those strategies ahead of time, you'll just be that much further ahead um, after the delivery and, and you'll kind of know where to start and, and how to get things going. Yeah, beautiful. So if you guys have more questions, just throw them in the chat box and I want to continue on with um, some tools that you can use um, during your journey with essential oils. So my name is Wendy Kohler and I am a retired physiotherapist, essential oil educator. Um, my background is I have a doctorate in physiotherapy and I now teach about natural health and essential oils. Um, that's my passion now after working in physiotherapy for about 10 years or so, both outpatient and inpatient. And um, what I've noticed in our oil group is that a lot of people have pelvic pain and this is why we did one of these webinars collaborated on it and I've worked with a few public health physiotherapists and uh, who are using essential oils in their practice and with their patients and they had wonderful recommendations and wonderful um, results and support systems and um, I know you know as a physio previously we would give people homework or home exercise program and uh, it was a challenge oftentimes to get people to actually do the work. So how I feel essential oils can fit in, and I'll tell you about their huge amount of benefits, um, is that it's an easy tool to turn to, to work with your treatment program with your therapist. So let's go through, here are some of the, so a few, there are hundreds and hundreds of reasons why you might use essential oils in general, but specifically related to pelvic floor and pelvic pain and um, these are some of the reasons. So essential oils can reduce pain, inflammation, and discomfort, and pelvic floor pain. Obviously, you're going to have all of those. Reduce scarring. So I've seen that myself with my C-section scar, but I'll talk about that. Uh, they can balance hormones, and whether you, no matter what age you are as a woman or a man, your hormones are always at play. Uh, improve or maintain urinary health. That's important. Reduce stress and anxiousness. And just like Catherine mentioned, um, you know, our level of stress and anxiousness can contribute in either in a like a chicken or egg way. You can that can make you feel more pain or your discomfort can cause you more stress and anxiousness. Um, mood management, you can reduce cramps and dysmenorrhea or dysmenorrhea, natural sleep and immune system or insomnia support. You can reduce fatigue, immune system and respiratory system support and to support you at home between treatments. And how's my volume? Is everybody okay there? I can't actually see the chat box now, so that's interesting. I usually can. Okay. So I'll give you a very quick rundown of what essential oils are. Basically, they're from plants. They are naturally found in plants, so the seeds, the bark, the roots, the flowers, uh, depending on what area of the plant the essential oil is carried. They are highly potent, so I use doTERRA essential oils because they're the most tested and most trusted essential oil brand, and they are 50 to 70 times more potent than herbs. So they're very powerful, and you only need one drop at a time. They can energize and uplift. They can cool or warm the body. They can help relieve uh, symptoms of coughs, cold, flus, and all that. Relieve joint and muscle pain. Those are some of the reasons of um, what, that's some of what essential oils are. They're basically comp complex chemical compounds found in plants that have a lot of therapeutic or health values. When you're looking at essential oils, it's very, very, and I can't even stress this enough, important that you know the quality, the purity, and potency because they matter significantly. There are four different grades of oils. Some of them that you're going to find on the market are actually just pure synthetic. That's what you get in your laundry and your candles, etc. There's another grade that's food grade. That's what you get in your mouthwash and your gum and your toothpaste. The next grade is um, therapeutic grade. So that's better. That's what you'd find at the mall store or the health food store. And you're going to get some uh, benefits from those oils, but in general, you're not going to get the same. And you can't, the testing standards are not the same. And then there's doTERRA who has a certified pure therapeutic grade essential oil. Um, we do the most testing on each of our oils. And one of the largest differences is where we source from. We source from around the world where plants grow in their actual environment, their ideal environment for their benefits. 
And this is important because, and I always give this example of if we tried to grow an orange tree in my backyard up here in Ontario, is that going to be the same as a Florida orange or Dominican Republic orange? So it really makes a difference where a plant is grown. How and why do essential oils work on a very quick, minute um, <laughs> little blurb here? They're super effective. They work on a cellular level, so they can get into cells and help improve the function of cells, and they can notice uh, things that are threats to your body, so bacteria and viruses, fungus, parasites, etc., and help to get rid of those in your body. Up here, you'll see different body systems that essential oils work on, so reproductive organs, cardiac, brain, lungs, stomach and digestive system, muscles and joints, cellular, like cellular health and function, and skin and hair and nails too. Um, they work with the body to improve what your body has, and they work with the body to kill off stuff that you don't need. And we also use them for cleaning. So they're Right here, there are three uses for essential oils. Really, I say there are four. Aromatic use is just breathing them in. So I would put a drop in my hands, rub them together, and breathe them in. And breathing them in, whether it's from a diffuser or in your hands or from a, you know, an aromatherapy locket, can have powerful, powerful, and quick effects on your emotions. So when we're talking about stress and anxiousness with pelvic floor dysfunction and pain, you can increase or improve your mood or calm your mood with different essential oils. When you have them going in a diffuser, you're getting the benefit out to everyone in the area. And sometimes you don't even know that you're getting the benefit, but you are. They also cleanse the air. So my husband's a chiropractor and in our clinical setting, we have a diffuser going all the time because we want patients to be calm when they get their adjustments. We want them leaving our office feeling, you know, uplifted and happier. And when they come in sick, which we want them to come in when they're sick, we can cleanse the air and protect ourselves when we're in there. So they're a great support for the respiratory system as they're cleansing the air as well. <clears throat> Topical use for essential oils, this is going to be important with pain aspect and multiple other reasons, but topically you can apply doTERRA essential oils to the skin. Normally we use what's called a carrier oil, so that's any vegetable-based oil. We really like fractionated coconut oil because something like olive oil is not very, you don't get a good absorption with that. So if you're having pain in your area, you know, in your perineum or in your hips or anywhere, you can apply and I'll talk about the oils for pain, some coconut oil, and just rub with the essential oil around that area. You can also apply essential oils to your feet to get uptake in the body for an overall effect. So if you were stressed, strained, overwhelmed, you could apply lavender to your feet for a very calming effect. The third way you can use our, our essential oils, but none other, okay, I wanna be clear on that, is internally. So you can get overall body effects and um, support digestion, your immune system, with internal use of essential oils. And I know I had the question before, and I'll answer this later, hopefully I'll remember, um, about pregnancy and which oils you can use when you're pregnant. doTERRA's oils are very, very safe to use. There are a couple cautions. One is a hormonal blend, and another one is birch. So uh, if you have specific questions on that, I can answer them. And then the fourth way you can use essential oils is in your cleaning products. So you can replace all those toxins in your home if you still have them in your home with essential oils because they're antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. You can clean all your surfaces simply and easily with water, essential oil, and vinegar if you want. And that's all we have in our home now for cleaning. And if you are pregnant or you have small children, that's going to be really important as they're crawling around and absorbing chemicals from cleaners. Instead, you can just replace with essential oils or when you're trying to spray down their toys, etc. And I know I'm talking fast, but I want to make sure that I am staying on time for you guys. So here are some essential oil suggestions for pelvic health and pelvic floor. And if you want, take a little screenshot or write some of these down. That's going to be helpful. Lavender is one of the amazing essential oils for calming. That's calming your nervous system, which includes you know, your whole body calming. Um, it is great for any skin irritations or wounds. So if you have a scar somewhere, you can apply some lavender around the area. And once the scar is starting to heal, you can apply it over. Um, lavender is excellent for sleep support. So if you are pregnant, 
and you're probably not getting a whole lot of sleep, you can apply lavender to your feet or put it in the diffuser to help with a restful night's sleep. And then the textbooks that we refer to, I mean, there are over 80 uses of lavender in our textbooks. So um, I'm just gonna touch on what's pertinent for our discussion tonight. But lavender is a staple everywhere. And you can even take it internally. Citrus oils are excellent for detoxing the body. And when they're breathed in or inhaled, um, they are wonderful for mood management and supporting, uplifting your mood. I personally use lemon or wild orange or grapefruit in my water every single day to help flush out toxins, support my urinary health, and my digestion. As well, citrus oils help with, by pro, uh, they help by providing your body with antioxidants, and that's great for fighting off things um, in your body and supporting good health. Deep Blue is our muscle and joint pain blend. It is a soothing blend. So it's excellent for inflammation, um, joint and ligament support, uh, calming inflamed tissues in general. And it's one of the top used ones for pain. And it's a blend of oils that helps work together. So you'd put a little bit in your hand, maybe one or two drops with some carrier oil and apply it where you need it. This is highly used by massage therapists as well because it penetrates the muscle tissue for muscle tissue regeneration and relaxation. So if you're pregnant and you're getting all this back pain, you can safely use deep blue on your back and your feet. And frankly, if I had it when I was pregnant, I would have probably put it just about everywhere. Um, Copaiba, this is a newer oil to doTERRA, and it is a phenomenal oil for inflammation and pain and liver support. Personally, I take it two drops a day under the tongue, and it uh, doesn't really taste like much, but I, it helps with overall inflammation in the body, and inflammation causes a lot of issues. Marjoram is an oil that maybe a lot of people might not know about, and marjoram is wonderful for pain support, headaches and head tension, tendon issues, um, constipation. It's great for relaxation. You can use it for cramps. Um, you would just apply to the area with some carrier oil again, and it's wonderful for muscle spasms. So if you're getting spasms in your pelvic region, apply it with some carrier oil. Lemongrass is an oil that is great for ligament support, bladder and urinary function. You would want to use it if you have a lot of water retention, same with the citrus oils, um, and thyroid issues for sure, whether it's hyper or hypo, it's been shown to help to um, balance thyroid issues out. Uh, cypress, cypress is an oil for flow in the body, so circulation, lymphatic flow, um, urinary health, restless legs, People will use it for incontinence. I know I had a friend who wanted to, her son was still wetting the bed and I made her a roller of cypress and I just told them to roll it on between his um, front hip bones across his pelvis region before bed, roll it back and forth a couple of times and his incontinence at night, his bed wetting improved. Cypress is also great for menstrual pain, for endometriosis and fibrosis. And then Aroma Touch is our massage blend. Wonderful benefits here. It's definitely used a lot for the, the pelvic health physios that are using essential oils. It's a massage blend, so it's gonna help tissues calm and relax. It's good for neuropathy, restless legs, muscle pain, spasm, joint pain, lymphatic flow, just overall circulation. And it's very calming, um, refreshing blend. Clary Calm, it comes in a roll-on. This one is for hormone balance. Now there is a bit of a caution here. You wouldn't want to use it. I use it all the time for hormonal emotional issues. I don't know if any of you have that. Um, and for cramps and back pain with, with my menstrual cycle. But if you're pregnant, you wouldn't want to use this one until after 38 weeks. Um, it's just a caution with that oil, but there are others that you can use. And then peppermint is another one that I wanted to touch on. And all the ones that I'm referring to now are um, many of, most of them have been pulled from the research and the rest have pulled from my textbook. So peppermint is an oil. It's a staple, staple in our home. Not only does it help with digestive issues and digestive discomfort, but it's shown to help reduce inflammation, you know, muscle and joint pain and things like arthritis. A lot of people will use it for a headache. So if you're a mama, you're probably, you know, 
or if you're sorry pregnant, you're probably not taking very many medications. And peppermint can be very soothing um, in the case of things like headache or indigestion, upset stomach, and then also cooling the body. If you're pregnant in the summer, especially this summer, it is so stinking hot out there, you can put a little bit of peppermint on and that's gonna cool your skin. Tons of uses for peppermint, but I just wanted to touch on on those um, specific essential oil suggestions for pelvic health that are found in the research and in the textbook. This graphic is difficult to see, so what I'll do is offer, if you'd like to receive my handout from this presentation, just write your email in the chat box and I'm happy to send it. This graphic will be in it. Um, but in general, essential oils can work on full body systems. So your endocrine or hormone system, there are oils that are gonna help with hormone balance and your hypothalamus and your thalamus, your pituitary gland, gland and so on. There are oils that are gonna help with skin and hair. Oh, and the one I didn't mention was for scar, for scarring. We have a few oils that help reduce scarring. So helichrysum is one, and Immortel, we don't have it right here, but Immortel is a roll-on blend that works wonders with scarring. And frankincense is wonderful as well for skin remodeling and um, structuring. Uh, what else is pertinent here? Urinary system. So oils that you can other oils you can use for your urinary system zendocrine is a blend that helps detox geranium juniper berry is a big one and lemon to help with urinary support so these are just some of the oils i can send this to whomever would like the graphic themselves and then muscle pain and joint um, muscle and skeletal pain aroma touch lemongrass wintergreen wintergreen we're not really going to use too much when we're pregnant but deep blue and there's a deep blue rub so if you want a handout that has this and the other information in it just put your email in the chat box and i will send that to you so how can you learn more i'm only touching on some of the basics usually what i do is meet with people one-on-one -on -one or in a small class it could be online could be in person or some people will host class classes and um, i come in and we talk about your health goals a little bit about doTERRA, I touched on it today, but there's so much more that you could know. And then go through oils that help people's specific health concerns. So this is a way, you if you don't already, have, if you already have an oil person, wonderful, fantastic, make sure you touch in with them to learn more. If you don't have someone who is your essential oil educator, I am happy to be that person for you. And I do love people. I love, obviously I love people, but I love helping people with their health concerns. And I do have, if you're booking an appointment with me um, within the next couple of days, if you make the booking within the next couple of days, I will give to you a Aroma Touch essential oil blend. So that's that massage blend. I think it's very appropriate for this webinar. I do want to, there are different ways to get started with doTERRA. I'm going to touch on two of our most popular kits just to show you an example of how you could get started. And so this is the Aroma Touch Kit. It's a smaller kit, starter kit, $180, and it comes with a diffuser, really important for emotional health, cleansing the air, etc. It comes with um, eight different essential oils that are helpful oh i even have the wrong picture up there how hilarious is that roman touch kit comes with wild orange peppermint um on guard that's our immune system boosting blend comes with tea tree comes with that aroma touch massage blend our deep blue blend blend balance that's one for calming and relaxation and um lavender so that kit's 180 and you would get a free 15 mil wild orange with it and then the Home Essentials Kit, this is our most popular kit, uh, most popular starter kit. So it has the top 10 essential oils that most families or people would start with for their overall health, whether that's digestion or allergies or immune system or pain or breathing issues or calming. It covers a huge array of um, essential oils where you can basically replace your medicine cabinet for your everyday stuff and you get some freebies with that, a wild orange and that copaiba oil that I was talking about. So those are just two examples of kits. There are a lot more um, available, but I thought these two would most pertain to our talk tonight. If you don't already have an oil person, 
again, you can connect with me and I'll happy, I'm happy to go through information with you and make sure that you would get off to the best start. And if you want to just get started right away, you can go to this link here. So bit.ly backslash Wendy Kohler doTERRA. And that's going to bring you to my personalized website where you could get started. And then here's my contact information. Overall, you can follow me on Instagram, which is where a few of you learned about this webinar. Here's my public page, Everyday Essentials with Wendy Kohler. Here's my email, everydayessentialsteam at gmail.com, and my phone number if you would like to connect with me through text or phone call. Whatever way you want to connect with me, I am happy to do that. So that's just a little bit about essential oils. I touch on it, and um, there's so much more that you could know. What we do when someone gets started with essential oils is we support them, uh, answer all their questions. We have a huge customer group where we provide a lot of education. That's where some of you learned about the webinar tonight. So I've got a few of your um, emails. I'm happy to send you the handout that I'll give. And just want to open it up and see if anyone had any other questions.